title of my sermon this morning is The Bond of Christian Marriage, Part 1. A couple married for 15 years began having more than usual disagreements. They wanted to make their marriage work and agreed to an idea the wife had. For one month, they planned, or they planned to drop a slip in a fault box. The boxes would provide a place to let the other know about daily irritations. The wife was delighted in her efforts and approach. Leaving the jelly top off the jar. Wet towels on the shower floor. Dirty socks not in the hamper. On and on until the end of the month. After dinner, at the end of the month, they exchanged boxes. The husband reflected on what he had done wrong. Then the wife opened her box and began reading. They were all the same. The message on each slip was, I love you. That's why husbands are smart. Where was the other one? What now? Where's the other one? I, I, do you really want me to read the other yes. one? I, I had another one. I decided I just, I, I don't know if I liked it. No, yeah, I, there, there's the other one. This is what I was going to begin with, and then I was going to read you that one. Uh, there, there were two lines of husbands in heaven. One for the dominant husbands, and one for the passive submissive husbands. The submissive husband line extended almost out of sight. There was one man in the dominant husband line. He was small, timid, appeared anything but dominant, a dominant husband. When the angel inquired as to why he was in this line, he said, My wife told me to stand here. <laughs> there we go. So today, and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about marriage. And another part I crossed off there is marriage and sex. Because that's really what we're talking about. I mean, I, so if you're not already awkward, you already feel a little weird, guess what? It's only beginning today. Marriage is a great thing ordained by God. Marriage existed right from the beginning of time. When God declared, as recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Of course, as I am sure you all know, marriage is by no means always easy. And there is much more to it than just a husband and wife spending the rest of their lives together. So this morning I will begin a series of sermons on the subject of marriage taken directly out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for all that you've done for us and the blessings you've poured upon us. I ask that you guide us now as we enter this, uh, this, uh, this sermon this morning, but also this study uh, that's going to take place over the next couple of weeks as we look through the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians and really discuss marital issues and sexual issues as well. I ask now that you bless us and allow us to stay focused on you in this. Allow us to just truly apply the, your word to our hearts and allow each and every one of us, including myself, to partake in your word today. In your name, amen. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to look right at verse 1, right off the bat here. If you don't have it, look under your seats in front of you, you'll find one. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, I'm going to read the first half of verse 1. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, like the first half of it. Now concerning the things about which you wrote... This is a, a, I guess, a section marker within the book of 1 Corinthians. I would say it's essentially the dividing point. Up to this point in 1 Corinthians, we have been hearing Paul address issues he received from the house of a woman named Chloe. That household gave Paul a report. Paul addressed those concerns. At this point, we are getting information, and he's addressing questions about, addressing questions that the Corinthian Christians had for them. These individuals gave him, um, had him, sent him a letter, and they gave him questions, and these are the questions. And I broke these down into four different sections, uh, these different questions. And if you have your bulletin, it's actually in your bulletin, these, these four, um, they're kind of the outline of the second half of 1 Corinthians. Uh, the first section, ver uh, chapter 7, is marriage, and that's what we're going to start talking about today. And then we're going to talk about things sacrificed to idols in Christian, or Christian liberty, Christian freedom, chapter 8 to 10. Then uh, number three, church order, um, chapters 11 to 14. And then church doctrine, specifically the resurrection in chapter 15. We're going to take a couple of weeks going through this. We're going to make our way through chapter 7, not, not super slowly, but I think we're going to take three or four weeks going through it. And Paul's counsel to the Corinthian Christians about marriage. This is how I break down the chapter. So if you look once again in your bulletin, you'll see a breakdown of this chapter. 
broken down into five groups. The first group is the one we're going to talk about today. General teachings on marriage. This is what Paul says about marriage, or really verse 2 to 7. Then we're going to read about uh, the teachings that Paul has on celibacy, on divorce, and on diverse situations in the next section. We'll get into that next week. And then there's something of a break, and I've got to figure out how this is going to tie into this. And it's the, this section that Paul talks about guiding, the guiding principle for decision-making, meaning remain as you are, and that's what Paul gets into. And it, it ties into the marriage thing. It also might be Paul going off into what field a little bit. Either way, we're going to talk about it, chapters, uh, verse 17 to 24. And then the, really the last sermon is going to be these number four and five, teachings on virgins and teachings on remarriage and widows. So, let's go ahead and get right into this first section. Now look at uh, really the introduction to the whole section once again. Uh, section, the second half of verse one. Uh, so I'm going to read all of verse one again. Now concerning the things about which he wrote, it is not good, or it is good, sorry, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Paul's discussion on marriage begins by, with him answering what seems to be the question that the Corinthian Christians had, and it's kind of an odd one from my perspective. Their question was, is it good to get married? More specifically, is it good to, for a man to touch a woman and, and from a perspective of sexually? Or should a man, thus, and thus a woman, stay celibate? To me, this is a little crazy considering what we were talked about in the past weeks, about sexual sin that was taking place within the church. These were individuals who were not necessarily prone to be celibate. You know, they, they were kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum here. Yet now their rationale is, well, since we can't control our sexual desires, we just won't have sex with anyone. And, and, and as we're going to find out, that's not really what Paul's talking about. That's not really what Paul's point was. Some translations might say it is not good, or is it good, the question being, is it good not to marry? And in reality, it's not talking about marriage, it's talking about sex in marriage, is really what it's getting at. Now, the more accurate translation is in regards to, uh, to marriage as much as, uh, as it is in regards to sex. The, the question is, is it good for a man not to have sex with a woman, with the context of their sexual dysfunction taking place within the church? Now, to gain another context on this, I think we need to, uh, need to understand Paul's marital status. And this is something you might find interesting as well. For the most part, without very little doubt, we believe that Paul was not married at the time of this writing. He was not married at the time of this writing. I would say he was not married at all during any of his writings. There is some debate that Paul was married before he was saved, and something happened to his wife, either... He divorced her again, living as a Jewish individual that was allowed, which I don't believe took place. I can't imagine he would have said that. The other option, and this is actually very interesting, um, was that his wife passed away. And the reasoning we think, the reason some people say he was married, is because the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, in order to be on that 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 court, they needed to be married. It, it, there was a requirement. Something important to remember, though, is that Paul never said he was on the Sanhedrin. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul talks about how he was moving up the ranks of Judaism. He was doing well. And even with that in mind, you might say, well, if one of the qualifications to move up to the top of Judaism is being married, why isn't he married? Nonetheless, the point of all of it is that this is all speculation. We really don't know. We do know that he was not married when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And I would say he was not married when he wrote most of the letters. Luke doesn't say anything about marriage. Paul doesn't say anything about a deceased or a divorced wife. You would think he would have said something. At this point, though, he was what they call celibate. It's what the word we're going to use today and in the coming weeks. And like I said, and to emphasize the point, very clearly, chapter 7, Paul is indicating that he is not married, that he is living a celibate life. From verse 1, Paul goes into detail about his personal thoughts regarding marriage. The rest of this first section of chapter 7, though, again, verse 1 to 7, in the rest of this chapter... Uh, the part of chapter 7, Paul explains to the church why most people do not remain celibate like him. What Paul is saying is this, it is good to remain celibate, but for the majority of humanity who are unable to do so, here is some practical advice. Here is what I have to say about this. So in verses 2 through 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul gives four pieces of advice for married people and people wishing to be married. So four pieces of advice. Number one, Sexual behavior is to be only within the bond of marriage. Sexual behavior is to be only in the bond of marriage. Look at verse 2. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. 
Paul's rationale, again, seemed to contradict and, and, and be the complete opposite of that of the Corinthians. The Corinthians are essentially saying that because of their sexual immoral behavior, they'll just abstain from sex altogether. They won't even have sex with their spouse, which we're going to get into that in a minute. Paul is telling the Corinthians that if someone is unable to control their sexual urges, that they should get married, thus satisfying those urges. And of course the reality, and we see this in society today, especially when it comes to the, to the different Catholic priests and other uh, similar situations, it, you're more likely to fail at being celibate. Not more likely. I mean, in, in those, I'm not saying every Catholic priest has failed at being celibate, but there's quite a few that we see in the news that have. And that's kind of the point. And that's why it's important to recognize what this is saying. With that in mind, again, Paul was celibate. So it's not saying that they shouldn't be celibate either. I think it's my point. My point is, the odds are against it. You know, it's an uphill battle, as you can imagine. With this in mind, Paul clearly stated that this, this, six, that this sexual behavior is to be within the bonds of marriage between one man and one woman. I mean, emphasize one man and one woman for a reason. Paul is not saying this. This is not what he's saying. He's not saying that since you cannot overcome the temptation to sin sexually, go ahead and have sex with whoever you, you want. That's not what he's saying by any means. He's saying that since you are unable to overcome the temptation to sin sexually, meaning to overcome the temptation to have sexual relations with someone outside of the bond of marriage, get married and have sex with your spouse. That's what he's saying. I mean, and it's very much to the point. That's what he's saying. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Any sexual behavior that is partaken in outside of the relationship between a husband and wife, and between those two alone, is a desecration to the marriage relationship, which as we're going to find out this afternoon when I do, when I do Becky and Mike's wedding, it is a marriage that's connected with God. These, we're, when we get married, it is a, and especially in the eyes of God, especially when it's a minister doing it, it's a marriage that is being, you know, really it's the three parts of a marriage, you know, the, the husband, the wife, and, the, and God. That's how it works. And that's why it's such a sacred thing. It's, it's a ceremony. That's why we have a ceremony to, to marry people. And of course, because of the words of Jesus, chapter 5 of Matthew, <coughs> sexual morality also extends to more than just the physical. It's also within your head. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 28, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery, meaning having sex outside of marriage. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Meaning, if you even think about it in your head, it's just as bad as doing it physically. The marriage bed is to be a sacred, it is to be sacred and held in highest regards. Because that marriage relationship is to be the closest relationship one has with another. And of course, like I said, it's supposed to be intertwined with God. Number two. The second piece of advice Paul gives them. There is to be equality and give and take within the bond of marriage. And now again, this kind of goes maybe against what some people say, especially when it comes to more conservative Christian people. Oh, it's a husband-led marriage. And it is. The Bible says the husband's the leader of the marriage. That doesn't mean there's not equality and give and take within every marriage. I'm telling you now, I would not be married now if there was not equality and give and take within my marriage. I mean, my wife would not be very happy. Let's go ahead and read though chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 3 and 5. 3 to 4, sorry, 3 and 4. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, FYI, Paul's clearly talking about sex here, once again. I'm going to apply this on a broader sense. I mean, this is much more, the, obviously, sexual, the sexual element of marriage is, is a key. But I would say this is also true of, of every element of your marriage. I mean, again, if you're, there's not give and take, if there's not equality, then there's going to be fighting. That's really how simple this is. You're going to butt heads because it's just not meant to be. Marriage is give and take. No marriage will work, or be healthy for that matter, if the husband and wife don't communicate with each other and work together to make sure the other is happy. Bottom line. Let's listen to what Peter says uh, regarding uh, the instructions he gives uh, about to a husband and wife, specifically now starting with the wife. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, meaning the word of God, 
they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. To submit means to follow another's leadership. The significance of this word really comes from milita a military perspective. I mean, a commander needs to have the submission of the rest of the, his, his crew. A mess of those people. If not, he just, he's not going to succeed very well as a commander. In the same way, it's true of a husband. Another way of understanding this word is also from a, an idea of protection. It is my job as the husband to protect my family. If my family doesn't listen to me, guess what? I'm not going to be very good at protecting them. You know, it's my job to protect them. It is my job to make sure the doors are locked. Me and the dog, we patrol the house every night. <laughs> now, of course, this was especially true in Jesus' time. If you can envision going back in time, even just a hundred years ago, this was especially true, you know? I mean, th this was needed. The husband needed to protect the wife. It was just the way it works. It was, my, it was the husband's job to protect the wife. If that didn't happen, there would be problems. Peter's other reason, of course, as he says, was in instances of a husband maybe going away from the word, a husband being distracted from God, and the wife, of course, still walking strong with God. As, as Christians, that's our goal. We need to be an imitation of the Lord. Put Jesus on display with your words and your actions. And that's very true of a, of a wife and a husband as well. The wife or husband, for that matter, but again, in this instance, the wife needs to, to continue living for Christ and living in the right way so that she could be an example to her husband who might have walked away a little bit from the faith. Now let's listen to what Peter's instructions are to the husband. Verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 3. You husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding or in a considerate way. I am to do my best to understand where my wife's coming from. Uh, here's another illustration I found. Um, what's his name? Collins is his first name. The guy who was uh, circling the moon on Apollo 11. I forgot his first name, but he was the lunar module pilot. It was not lunar. The command module pilot. The thing, I, something, I forgot his first name, but he was saying how... You know, something about the average man speaks 20, um, 25,000 words a day, and the average woman speaks 30,000 words a day. The difference was, he's already spoken him, and all, spoken all of his when he gets home and his wife just begins. It is very, very true. And a lot of times, that's how marriages are, right? You have to be understanding, and a lot of times that might mean I just have to sit there and listen. I mean, and here's another, what's another illustration? I'm trying to think of another example. Um, something about ESPN. And it was a comedian on one of the um, Christian comedian stations talked about how, you know, his wife just goes and goes and goes. And he kind of wishes that when she was done, there'd be da 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 you know, like Sports Center. <laughs> but, okay, the, the point here is that we need to understand each other. And then again, in this situation, obviously, a husband needs to understand his wife. Paul expands on this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, which uh, was read a little bit earlier. Uh, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I mean, Paul is saying, Husbands, love your wives to the extent that you would die for her. That's what he's saying because that's what Jesus did for the church. I mean, and so if that alone gives you some, some context here. I hope it does. Then, of course, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 summarizes all of it. Paul says, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. I mean, that's the bottom line. The point is, there needs to be equality, there needs to be give and take within the marriage. Number three, and here's the fun one. Don't deprive each other sex. Here we go. This is when it gets a little more awkward. Don't deprive each other sex. Look at verses five and six. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come to, together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. Here's a rather true statement. Sex is a rather key element of marriage. I mean, the truth is, if there wasn't sex within a marriage, there would just be a good friendship. And that's not marriage. Interestingly, during the ancient, ancient times, during the Jesus' time, and even beyond, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob kind of thing, the, the consummation of the marriage was essentially the wedding. 
Listen to what Moses writes in Genesis chapter 24 regarding Isaac and him meeting and marrying Rebekah. Now Isaac had come from, the go, uh, from, from going to bear Loi, Roy, I think is how we're going to say it. For he was living in Negev, in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. <coughs> then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Henry VIII is maybe not the best example of how to have a successful marriage. But <laughs> Henry VIII was able to marry his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who was actually the wife of his brother, because he proved somehow, you know, I don't understand how, that, that, that marriage was never consummated. And interestingly, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Marital Causes Act of 1973 still says that if consummation doesn't take place, the marriage can be annulled. So go figure. So uh, only in Britain. Sex is a key part of a happy marriage. It should be, it should not be withheld from the other forever. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 25. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the, or into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There should be no shame in marriage. And there should be no shame in the marriage bed as well. There are times, of course, when abstaining from sex is, uh, is acceptable and is needed. But Paul said that these should be times that were not permanent and times that were devoted to the Lord in a time of prayer. Almost like fasting is how the kind of the way I would look at it. But in reality, the prolonged abstinence from sex is not good for marriage, as Paul says, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That was his, in the beginning of all of this. That's his point. No self-control. And that's the truth. So if you abstain from sex, you're more likely to, to commit sexual sin. First Thessalonians Chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. We should abstain from sex within our marriage. It's just part of the deal. Number 4. Being married or being single are both gifts from God. Being married or being single are both gifts from God. Again, Paul has already indicated that living a, a life of celibacy was, was okay. It's what happens. But let me, let's go ahead and read the text. Verse 7. Yet I wish that all men were even as I am myself, or I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God. One in this manner, and another in that. So again, Paul indicates that living a life of celibacy, living a life single and in abstinence from sex, there's nothing wrong with it. That's a good thing. He actually wishes that everyone could experience it. Nonetheless, according to Paul, either situation is a gift from God. And that's important to remember. Whatever your circumstance, whatever you have going on in your life, that is what God has chosen for you. He has chosen that for you. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good thing given... And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. I think that one of the hardest parts of walking with God is trying to understand His will. You know, there are times where we don't understand what's going on. We don't know why the circumstances are there. I mean, maybe you're a single and that's your thought. You know, I want to be married, but I'm not. Or maybe you're now a widow or whatever the circumstances may be. And you're struggling through something. And it's hard. Because how do you, you know, it's hard to say I trust God when things are difficult. It's just the way it is. That's how it is. But you need to trust God when things are difficult. Because God will provide for all your needs, including the need of a spouse. So that's where you're at. First John chapter 1, or chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 
This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. We need to trust God. We need to trust the Lord no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, and we need to know that God will provide. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that every so that always having all okay, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. God will provide for you. No ifs, ands, or buts. Bottom line, God will provide for you. He'll provide for your needs. And He'll also provide for those desires that you have as well. If it's in His will, if it's in His timing. You need to talk to Him. Talk to God about what's going on. Tell Him what's going on. Explain to Him all that you have going on. All your concerns and all your frustrations. And He hears you. And He wants to comfort you. He wants to take you in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Come to me. This is Jesus speaking. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and, I, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Turn your life over to Jesus. Allow Him to take control of everything, and it will be a lot better. Let me close up. One of my favorite marital illustrations involves Harry and Bess Truman, of course, the president of the United, former president of the United States. Some time ago, the Harry S. Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, made public 1,300 recently discovered letters that the late president wrote to his wife, Bess, over the course of a half century. Mr. Truman had a lifelong rule of writing to his wife every day they were apart. He followed this rule whenever he was away on official business or whenever Bess left Washington to visit her beloved Independence. What is most impressive is the simple fact that every day he was away, the President of the United States took time out of his dealings with the world's most powerful leaders to sit down and write a letter to his wife. And to me, that's just it is an amazing thought. You know, he didn't get to just email or text her either. You know? He had to write her and put the stamp on it and stuff. And that's not always easy. I'm sure he didn't put the stamp on it. Oh, no, he did. This wasn't like today. The president back then was a little bit different than the president today. So either way, I'm sure he stamped it. He might have even walked it down the street. I don't know. The hard reality is that marital relationships will not always be smooth. You will face rocky times. You will have to travel through them. It's not going to be easy. On our own, we are doomed. With the other, we have hope. But with God, all things are possible. Allow God to be the mix, the, the, the mortar that holds you together. So whether you've been married for 10, 20, 30, 40 or more years, or whether you're just starting, remember who's the glue that keeps your marriage together. Remember who's the boat that keeps your marriage afloat. Remember who loves you more than anyone else could ever possibly love you on this world, even your spouse. In the same way that you are called to give your lives 100% over to God, the same is true of marriages. If you are having troubles within your marriage, give it up to God. If you are having troubles living life as a single individual, tell the Lord about your hardships. If you are having troubles or problems, with sexual addiction and sin. Give your troubles over to the Lord. Why? Because He loves you. He wants you to succeed individually and as a couple. All you need to do is trust in Him. Let's close in prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, I thank You and I praise You now. I ask that You guide us as we go forth. Help us fight off the sinful addictions that we have, no matter what they may be, if that's a sexual addiction or whatever. Help us fight it off with you on our side. Help us know that you are in control. If we put our full trust in you, we will be guided through whatever the circumstance with you as our leader. Help us know that you are an amazing God. A God that gives comfort to arguing spouses. A God who gives comfort when we're struggling through anything, Lord. Help us know this as we depart. Help us know that you are an amazing Lord who's going to care for us. An amazing God who wants us to be one with you. Lord, the hard truth is that no matter how much we love our spouse, we need to love you more. Lord, help us love you. Help us love you more than we can love anyone on this earth. Help us have a relationship with you that's strong and that's going to guide us through the difficulties of life, through the addictions, through the temptations, through the sins. I thank you, Lord, in your wonderful name. Amen.